so I'm gonna actually get started. I'm gonna talk a little bit about the cold cream and the history of it while I'm making it, but I'm gonna get started because there's lots to do. So um, the other thing I'm gonna be demonstrating a little bit of is some best practices when you're working at home, making your own things. Oh, and by the way, this is my name. It's hard to spell. GLaDOS Vachon, it's just a version of Gladys. So, hi, this is me, since you won't see my face. Um, so first things first, if you want everything to be clean, you need to sterilize everything. And this isn't just a COVID thing, this is an all the time thing. Um, so I have just a little bit of 70% um, alcohol in here, and I use that to sterilize my work surfaces and um, anything I'm gonna be putting the things I'm making in. Um, so I have my pan here. And for this, because we're making a small amount of uh, cold cream, I actually just use a plain stainless steel measuring cup as a pan on the stove. Um, I also have fancier ones. You can use any metal uh, measuring cup, but um, I got the stainless steel one out because this is probably similar to what you have sitting around in your kitchen. Um, so for heat, um, you're not gonna need much. I put my stove literally at just at the top side of the two marker, and you're not gonna need it much hotter than that because beeswax, and this is why I recommend actually starting on the stove and getting to know the beeswax and how it works and all the other ingredients and how they work at a lower temperature because this is a lower, much more controlled temperature. When you work with beeswax on fire, it actually heats up much more than it needs to, which means it stays liquid and hot much longer and the only time I've ever burned myself was when I was dealing with beeswax over an open flame. So it's just a little bit more finicky and it's better to wait. Um, so uh, we put the beeswax in first because it needs the most melting. Um, so that goes on the bottom. It's also coincidentally like the sturdiest ingredient. So having it the most exposure to the heat is the best. Um, so I'm doing today what I would call a double recipe. Um, this is the normal amount of cold cream. As you can see, it's not very much that I make with this, with my recipe, so, which is normally half this size. But just so that you can see the amount, um, you can see what I'm doing, um, and the, it's not such tiny amounts of ingredients, I doubled the recipe for today. You don't wanna make a lot in advance because it will go bad. Uh, as Jada said, you can keep it in the fridge, but um, the liquid ingredients, are going to go bad and then they are going to and the moisture is going to make the um, oil ingredients go rancid so you really just can't store it for a long period of time I wouldn't I wouldn't even try so um, this is the oil I have all my ingredients pre-mixed or pre-measured which is also a really good idea it's not just for demonstrations and cooking shows I promise um, once the heat is on you want to know where everything you're gonna need is Okay, so while that's melting, I can talk a little bit more. Also, um, if one of the event hosts is here, um, I don't mind taking questions while I'm working um, from anybody if they have questions about what's going on, but I'm, I can't really see the chat or follow it from here. Um, and I don't wanna just say, everybody holler questions at me because I'm gonna have melted beeswax and that's not the best time to have questions hollered at you. So um, I'll keep yeah. an eye on the chat box and I'll also keep an eye on the raising hands. If you guys would just raise your hand and let me unmute you and, and tell you to go ahead and ask your question. Uh, that way we can call on people in the order they raise their hands. Yeah, um, because I really don't mind um, having questions while I'm working, just like I said, not, as long as it's not everybody hollering questions at me. Um, so while these things are in, um, they're gonna be heating up and melting. I get the water phase. So this is a two phase preparation but it's a physical emulsion or a mechanical emulsion, not a chemical emulsion, but it does still have two phases in it like a regular emulsion, which an emulsion is when you use a chemical called the emulsifier, creative, uh, to actually join the um, oil molecules to the water molecules. In this, we're going to sort of be making a beeswax prison for all those things to make them stay together and uh, not separate. Um, so I have the honey and the honey is really thick and stuff. So to make it just a little bit easier to work with, I like to take my other water-based ingredients and mix them in with the honey. Um, so that's my rose water. 
And this is just a tiny bit, and I am using uh, red wine vinegar in this case. You can use any kind of vinegar you want. Um, I made this with apple cider vinegar. I just feel like, honestly, it's a little too harsh for my face because my face is a delicate flower. So one of the things that's really great about this recipe is that you can customize it as you would like. Um, so uh, definitely use local honey, local beeswax if you can get your hands on it. You can steep, um, instead of rose water, you could use um, something steeped in calendula or um, some kind of like tea basically of an herb that you think is gonna be nice for your face. Uh, you can also infuse the oil um, and that will add that can bring something else to it so you can really customize it and make it however you want so do you see the honey is a lot more liquidy and that makes it a lot easier to put in here now i know you're thinking why are you putting the water phase in here just directly into the fat phase the lipid phase and because there are instructions and this is the thing that's crazy this recipe as jada talked about has been in continual human use since the second century common era. So it's one of, it's basically the oldest continuously used human cosmetic. And we know that it's continuously, I'll gesture with this hand, we know that it's continuously used because we have a recipe in the second century when Galen, and that's why I have this book here. This is Galen's Hygiene. Um, this is actually the original source of the cold cream recipe. Woo, okay. Um, so, uh, it pops up here and then it has instructions and a, a list of ingredients. You have to figure out the ratios for yourself because th that's historical recipes. Um, and we know that it's in continuous use because every hundred years or so there's a new recipe that pops up somewhere in the Western world of people passing this uh, Galen's wax recipe around. Um, and they update it every now and then. Um, to sort of reflect local customs or local availabilities or sometimes trends. Trends are important. And I think trends are really important to think of. Um, the fact that modern cosmetic culture is so awash in trends, it's not really new. When you're studying um, historical cosmetics, you can see very much that there are trendy ingredients that come and go in their, their popularity um, over time. So you don't, uh, you have to consider that when you're thinking about ingredients and then you can make substitutions based on that. So it starts with olive oil. Um, and that's what I'm using here is some nice basic olive oil. Um, I got the things here so I can show you. It's nothing fancy. Um, it's something you can get at the grocery store. Beeswax I get from my local apiary. Um, but you can get some at the craft store. You can easily order some over the internet. Just make sure it's pure. Um, but I like to get it fresh and I like it when it's not been washed out and bleached. Um, for honey, again, I get that from my local apiary and a shout out to JAB. Yes, JAB apiary here in Florida because this is where I've got, I source the honey for this from. For rose water, you can get this at most Middle Eastern food stores. Um, I specifically chose this rose water though because this one actually lists having preservatives in it on the label. Normally, I'm not the most into that because the preservatives they use are kind of wonky, but um, in this case, um, because I'm like, I want this to be, have as long a shelf life as possible, having the rose water with some preservative in it will help preserve the entire recipe. Um, but if I was getting rose water to like, consume, I probably wouldn't um, get something with preservatives. And then, as I mentioned before, the red wine red wine vinegar. You can also get this at a grocery store, um, unless you live with some places, very small grocery stores that are very niche, but you can use any kind of vinegar. You don't have to be finicky about it. Uh, you can also infuse your vinegar with things, just like you would for cooking, like basil or something like that. Okay. So I'm gonna do a thing just to get this moving along. Um, I'm gonna turn up my heat. You don't need to turn up your heat. I would suggest waiting, um, especially while you're not familiar with the process and familiar with the ingredients. But I have made this a few times 
and I'm pretty familiar, especially with making things on the stove. So I'm going to turn it up a little bit um, and hopefully melt my beeswax a little bit faster. So the instructions for this recipe tell you that you are supposed to heat up the oil and the wax, and then you're supposed to slowly, and, and the honey, and the, I, yeah, and then you slowly add the water and vinegar cold into this and stir it like crazy the entire time. I've never really actually gotten that particular method to work. I've gotten a modified version of that method to work where I carefully heated the water phase and the lipid phase to exactly the same temperature. But even that was only like a crapshoot. Like I would say, honestly, it was less than 50-50, but it would come out sometimes. Um, this is actually the way that Jada does it. Um, you can use, and she let me know that you can use an immersion blender um, to get it to work in that way. But this way works pretty much every time. So what I do is I just put everything into, into the same cup and I let it melt all together. And um, I'm just keeping it moving here because the honey is starting to bubble and you will see the honey, the water phase, start to bubble and boil within the lipid phase, which is a kind of a crazy thing. But as you can see, now that I up the heat just a wee bit, all my beeswax is melting very fast. Okay. I'm gonna actually turn it off because I'm getting to the part. <coughs> Pardon, it's allergies, it's not COVID, I promise. Um, so you're watching, and I don't know how well you'll be able to see this on the video, but um, you're watching to make sure that all of your bits of beeswax have melted. Um, and I just like to keep it moving, um, especially when I'm having it over a higher heat. There we go, okay, so it's all melted. So we, now what you do is you take it off of the heat and you start to whisk it. Um, now, I'm using a fork uh, just to show you that you can. Um, you can use a whisk if you have a whisk small enough to fit inside the cup, um, but you probably don't, and if you don't, that's okay because you can use a trusty fork. Um, I'm gonna let it rest or let it sit just for a second, but I'm keeping my eye on it, um, and that's just because I got it hotter than you should. The, the thing with the heat is that you have to, um, you want to use the lowest heat possible because heat is sort of the enemy of active ingredients and everything. So to the extent that there are, um, actives in this that will affect my skin in a positive way, they are going to be hurt by heat. That's why all your products say keep it out of the sun or whatever. Um, so this is the same thing. Um, and that's why I recommend you use as low a heat as you need to melt that beeswax. Now the other thing I discovered because of this one pot theory of making this, which is completely up to my, uh, my friend, Lady Imeria, uh, she was working with me one day and she suggested I try it, her words, the lazy way. Uh, so I did, and I figured out that it works way better than the fancy way listed in all the books. I, okay, I, see, that's what happens when I get distracted by the chat. Someone's talking about sour wine. Yeah, they talk about sour wine, they talk about old wine, they talk about um, all kinds of references to it. Um, but in this one, it actually specifically says vinegar, not sour wine, um, at least in my translation of it. So you, the thing about this is, and the reason why I'm keeping such a close eye on it, is you wanna be already whisking it when it starts to solidify. And that's the mechanical emulsion. And I'm really sorry, I know it's sort of hard to hear me over the sound of the fork. Um, it's the same with a whisk, I promise. Um, because we're making a mechanical emulsion or a physical emulsion and not a chemical emulsion, we don't have an emulsifying molecule to join the lipid molecules together with the water molecules. We only have the lipids and the waters and we know they don't mix. Water and oil don't mix, water and wax don't mix. That's, that's just, that's a thing we all know, right? So basically what I'm doing here is defying laws of water and oil not mixing. And the way I can do that is because the beeswax is solid at room temperature. So by keeping it moving constantly at the time it begins to solidify, not after. And that's part of the thing. You have to be stirring and whisking before it starts to solidify. By doing that, the beeswax can actually 
sort of imprison all the water and lipid elements together so that it forms a creamy consistency and it seems like a chemical emulsion without actually making one. So uh, I don't actually have a lot of luck putting mine in the fridge and you definitely can't freeze it. So this is something that you don't want to make a bunch of if you don't need it. Um, so I, yeah, I have a question about number one, you know, keep stirring, keep stirring. Um, That's okay. <laughs> I don't want you to like not stir and mess it up because of me, but I, <laughs> so two things. First, I do always make too much. Like I don't have a good recipe for making, like the amount that you have in there is probably perfect. Um, I usually make like triple that and then I have to put some in the fridge because I don't want it to start going rancid too soon or I don't want any of the water left in it to start growing bacteria. Um, second- Which is a real concern that people don't think about. It's really important that you think about the fact that invisible things that are bad for your skin and bad for your body can be growing in products if they're not preserved. Yes. Um, and I, I worry about that so I keep it in the fridge. Uh, second question. So I am mistaken then. When I read about vinegar, like vin agra means sour wine, basically. Oh. So okay. that is later on, that's in like the 15th, 16th century when they're talking about vinegar and they talk about sour wine. So wine that's a little bit old. So what you're saying is we should be using real vinegar instead of just sour wine. I, yeah, I use real vinegar in it. And in my translation of hygiene, it says vinegar. It does. It definitely it does. does. Yeah, it, it says like the vinegar of roses, which I'm not even sure what that is, but it's definitely vinegar. Yeah, you're right. It would, so I guess I need to do a little research on exactly what the type of vinegar they would have had. I have white vinegar and I also have apple cider. I have a couple of red wine vinegars and white wine vinegars that I could try, but I haven't experimented with how they're different. So the first time I made it, when I made it from Galen's recipe, I made it with just white vinegar, a splash of white vinegar, because that's what it says. Um, and then after that, when I read something about how they used vinegar in the 15th century, what vinegar was, I started using just old white wine, but maybe that's completely wrong. So thanks for making me think of that. Um, so at least um, a couple of chat um, responses. So, okay. First, uh, Lucia says the vinegar is the wine that had the alcohol eaten by bacteria to produce acetic acid, um, acetic acid. And then she said different types of vinegar are from what alcohol you start with. Yeah, so I'm gonna I'm gonna do some experiments. I wanna try and it's starting to solidify now. So this is the time you'll see on the side. This is the time when it's really important to stir a lot. Um so in in Chotula, I know in other things they actually specifically say old wine or thick wine or something like that versus vinegar. Um and I what I use is I just use a wine vinegar because like the Romans loved wine, they drank a lot of wine, we know that, that's that's not even a thing that I have to prove to you, like we just know. Um, so I use that, if they've got a lot of wine, when it goes bad, they've got a lot of wine vinegar. And I really think that there's a pragmatism of reuse and a limiting of ingredients that we're just not used to working. We're used to going to the grocery store and getting whatever we want. And yeah, in Rome, when you lived in Rome, the center of the world, you could do that. But at the same time, if they have one thing, they're gonna use it for whatever they can. Um, it's like they, they have olive oil, so they use olive oil for everything. Um, so I kind of try to stick with other ingredients that I already know are used from culinary practice or things like that. That makes sense. Um, so you can see it's starting to get creamier, but it's not all the way. So keep keep whisking. Um, if you have other questions, I totally can answer them while I'm whisking. So Lucia also commented that she has homemade vinegars from failed brewing. So that's a great reuse of what you know you thought would be one thing, but now it's something else that you can actually use. Absolutely. Well, and if you're brewing at all, that's really helpful because there are lots of recipes that will call for. I was actually just looking at a, like, possibly a bleach, but it's supposed to be a golden hair dye, um, and that uses the dregs from white wine. 
So if you're brewing, you have a lot of things that are used in medicinal and cosmetic practice already, just kind of laying around. Not to mention the wine itself or the cider itself. Those things are, those things are used. Uh, okay, so it is very creamy, but it's still just a little liquidy. That's why I keep pausing is to see like the consistency and to get the stuff scraped off the sides. If there's stuff scraped that's starting to build up on the sides. So Federico chimed in that um, always remember that Romans used to drink wines that were often more sour than ours because they often spoil and also like less alcoholic, which is why I like fortified Roman wine, to be honest. Um, and we don't have the time to get drunk. <laughs> And then, but vinegar was definitely something different from wine for them. So that is something I can study up on. Um, Lucia also chimed in and said the interconnectedness of their ingredients is eternally fascinating. And so that's something that you and Lucia can geek out on because, yes, I, I absolutely believe that. And I know GLaDOS um, talks about that in lots of her classes. Um, yeah, well, and that's one of the things about this particular recipe with the cold cream. It changes over time with availability and trends. Like once whale oil pops up, they're saying, oh, it's whale oil is what you obviously need to make cold cream, right? Galen didn't know. And um, before that, in the Renaissance, they usually use like almond oil, um, just because there was a huge import of that probably from the Levant and they were really into almonds. And that was like the trendy thing to use at that time. Um, and that's <clears throat> how we like, those are the little updates that have occurred in this recipe that can actually be traced over time so that we can actually track that this is a continually used product. And um, in the modern one, which I've seen in a 1950s cosmetic formulation manual, um, uses mineral oil. Um, and that's what you get in your ponds, cold cream, or various things like that, like in your store-bought cold creams nowadays. Uh, but the recipe is still the same. Okay, so this is getting, I'm still gonna whip it just a little bit just to make sure that it's nice and uh, amalgamated is a good word for it. Um, but this is sort of the consistency and color that you're looking for. Um, it's very creamy colored and it's stiff, like it's starting to stick to the bottom of the pan I'm using and it starts to stick to the fork. Um, so let's all thank uh, the Great British Bake Off and Master Chef for teaching me cooking terms so that I can communicate more effectively with everyone in the world uh, because I actually really don't cook food at all. Um, so, but I know that this is this consistency, sort of like a custard now, thanks, cooking shows. That's um, wonderful. And I would have stopped, I would have actually stopped stirring a long time ago. I'm glad we have this video now. I think you've been stirring for more than 15 minutes. So yeah, that's probably yeah. why I've never had success with this method. And I just use an immersion blender because I'm a horrible reenactor. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm going to tell you between doing it last night in case I didn't wake up and doing it today, my arm hurts a little bit. Like you're not a bad reenactor. If you were alive in the Roman era or any era, honestly, and you had the money to be running around wearing this or using this, um, you, you would have other people to make it for you. So it, there's nothing wrong with using, you know, um, a plug-in slave <laughs> or plug-in servant to help you out with those things, especially if you have an injury or something like that. Um, it, there's nothing wrong, you know, self-care is self-care. Um, so this is, this is what I would call done. It's like a thick custardy, consistency. And um, the way I actually like to use this as, oh, it's still really warm. I, the way I actually like to use this is as um, step one of a double cleanse, um, which is really popular in the skincare, dermatological things. So I use this all over my face and either wipe it off with a warm, wet washcloth, or I will just take it off with a um, water-based cleanser. Not soap, but a water-based cleanser. Um, but it has a nice creamy consistency. You can smear it into your skin. And actually, with an amount this much, <clears throat> this is enough for both my hands. I'm going to rub them together. And then after I'm off camera, I can take just a little bit of water and get that to get rid of the tackiness from the honey. And then it's just like hand lotion. And it's actually really nice. Um, but so this is the thing, like, if you, you wash your hands a lot because we don't want to die of the plague, 
um, but your hands start to get gross and, and chapped and um, flaky, or you have eczema like I do and they're always like that, it's just worse now. Um, when your hands are still damp after you wash, you can rub some of this in with that extra water and it, it makes a nice lotion. You can also use it as that way on your face um, where you put just a little bit of dabs on and then you rub it in with more water. And that helps capture all, pull all that water into your skin uh, because the honey is hydrophilic, which means it loves water. Uh, so it attracts water molecules to it. And so it helps to um, draw moisture in from the air into your skin. It also brings all that moisture from the water and then the beeswax and oil form a sealing uh, sort of lid on it. It sort of wraps it up and keeps it inside your skin. So it's actually really good for your skin. Um, I love to use it uh, as like a cleanser. And honestly, if you have to go with one cosmetic to take care of your flesh package, um, no matter what your gender, I would absolutely recommend this one. Um, you see things on Pinterest about a honey cleanse or a vinegar cleanse or an oil cleanse. This is a little bit of all three. Um, and it's not the same as scientific research, but you know, centuries and centuries and centuries of um, use history, they mean something. So I, I love this and I love sharing it and I love being able to make something and participate in such a beautiful centuries old human tradition. Um, but I wanna tell you one fun thing before we go. Uh, in Galen's Hygiene, this recipe is not made for faces and it's not made for skin. Uh, this is recommended as, as everything in Galen's Hygiene is, is for men because women um, are a special class of cold, wet weirdos um, and our humors are all wrong to be fully healthy humans. But men, men can be. And so they, these are the things they need to do to take care of their flash packages. And when, if they're not having children at the rate they'd like, uh, that they, Galen acknowledges that that may be because their, their, their sperm are too hot. Uh, and so to cool the loins, they make the cold cream and apply it to the loins, which would be the testicles. Um, and that vinegar gives it a little bit of a cooling feeling. So that's the actual origin of it. But within 100 years of Galen having it in this book for male genitalia, uh, people are using it on their faces and we've been using it on our faces ever since. And honestly, I, I have a really hard time convincing anyone to try it the way Galen originally intended. Um, if there's any questions, that's all I have to share. So um, I'm happy to answer anything that anybody has. Uh, oh, let me tell you the recipe. Um, the recipe is listed in the handout. Um, and I'm not sure, it may be a double or a half of this. This is, I made double for this just because otherwise the vinegar is such a tiny amount. Um, so this is, um, actually, no, I'll read the single recipe because honestly, this is all I recommend you make at home. 3.5 grams of beeswax, 14 grams of oil of your choice, this was olive. 1 16th teaspoon. It's hard to find a 1 16th teaspoon, but if you can drag it down, especially if you're interested in making more cosmetics, you will use it, so I would find that. Um, three teaspoons of, oh, I'm sorry. That cannot be right. One point five teaspoons honey, and a half a teaspoon of rose water. Okay. Wait, wait, wait! Before you put that down, hold it back up. I love that. What What's going on with this? Is this your wax tablet? It It is a wax tablet, but this is my bigger one, and I, I'm not I'm not gonna lie. I like hide post-it notes inside it. That is so. so it's. Cute. I love it. Okay, go ahead. I just like it to have for demos because I like to, especially when there are mundane people, I like to give them as much a slice of history as possible with the open acknowledgement that I use uh, alcohol in a spray bottle to sterilize everything because we know more about germs than they did. Like they did everything they could to fight against germs, but they couldn't see them and they didn't understand them as well as we do. But they worked hard to fight against germs. So, um, you know, we should stand on their shoulders and, and work as hard as we can to fight germs as well. Good plague message. <laughs> So let's see. So some of the comments are about making this cold cream for hand cream later. It does work well. After I put mine on my face in the morning, I do rub it all over my hands. Mm -hmm. um, 
And it's my elbow cold. goes in, you know, anywhere that I think is a little dry, just because that um, barrier that she talks about, that the beeswax, uh, that breathable barrier that the beeswax makes to hold in all the, of the moisture is just wonderful. Um, yeah. I have a comment on... Oh. I will say the, the only oil I've had not work in this so far is um, castor oil. Castor oil always separates out when I try it, so worth saying. Oh, so when you make this, it doesn't separate, um, and you don't put it in the fridge, so it doesn't separate? Nope. Okay, yeah, so I need to just it's learn nice. to start longer. <laughs> yeah, that's, honestly, don't feel bad if you try this and you haven't stirred long enough, because the main thing, I give people this recipe and then they'll message me and they'll be like, it just never comes out. What's the trick? And I'm like, you got to keep stirring, man. And they'll send me pictures of it like three quarters of the way done. And I'll be like, keep stirring. Um, and when I teach this class, um, when there are other people around, honestly, I stir and then I pass it off. As soon as my arm starts to get even a little tired, I pass it off and I let the students pass it around and everybody can stir a little bit. Um, and we just make as much as we need for all the students to take some home. Um, but we all take turns stirring it together. It's like, look how thick it is. Like a thick old meringue. <laughs> all right, are there any more questions, you guys? You can type in the chat box, you can raise your hand. Um, so it doesn't look like there are any questions. I think you covered everything pretty well, and I think people are really happy that they took this class. You have a couple of thank yous in the chat box. Uh, Thank you guys for coming. And we have about, I don't know, we have 25 minutes until the next class. So if you want to stick around and talk about anything or explain the difference. Um, so you have, what are your utensils for this? You had everything in its own little jar before you put it together. Um, yeah. So you just gather your things together, you're on the stovetop. If you were doing this over a flame, about how long would it take for you to melt everything? And do you use a fire fire or do you just use like a burner, like an alcohol burner? Or do you use a candle um, when you're doing it over a flame, like at an event where you're in a full like living history situation? What is your setup like? Um, so the best thing, and I think probably the most accurate thing, is to get in on the edge of a cooking fire and to use some coals just on the edge of a cooking fire. Um, you could cook this one in clay, but I wouldn't recommend it because it's gonna make the whisking last so much longer because the clay is gonna retain heat way better than the metal. And that's gonna keep your, um, your cream from setting up. Um, so I would do this still in a metal vessel of some type um, and just sneak it in on the corner of a fire that are on like the, embers. Um, but if you don't have that, uh, I use an alcohol tabletop burner um, for when that's not possible. Um, you can use a brazier with a few coals in it. That would be fine. Coals are actually better than a flame. Like the alcohol burner with an open flame, if you're using a flame, it's going to get hotter than you need the beeswax to be, which means that you have to whisk it longer. Um, and it also, I've never burned myself with beeswax uh unless i was heating it overheating it on a flame and also if you're going to be heating any kind of possible accelerant like oil or wax over a flame you should have a fire extinguisher um, so i just think it's kind of it's not as forgiving uh as the working on the stovetop it's easier to ruin the ingredients because you can't actually overheat the honey if you cook it too much um and it's just a lot more like beginner friendly but once you start to get used to how the beeswax works, if you're working in it in this, make this recipe a lot or make just various recipes um, where you're used to how the beeswax functions. Um, I kind of think of it as getting to know the beeswax like a person, getting to know its personality. Uh, then, then you can be moving on to a fire, like an open flame or um, embers and be a lot more prepared for what's going to happen. Because even embers are hotter than I have the stovetop, probably even than I had it when I turned it up. I keep it really low. Okay, so we have another question in the chat box. It is, if you don't have beeswax handy right now, what other waxes could you possibly use that you might have in your home? I haven't tried it, but soy wax might work because soy wax is hard at room temperature. I don't know if soy wax is a thing that people have in their homes, I have 
four and a half pounds of it, but that might just be me. Um, and there are some recipes with paraffin, but I wouldn't suggest you put that on your face. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you could, like I used to be really, really super anti um, petrochemicals, but for some people with allergies, sometimes that's actually better, like mineral oil, um, because there's no possibility of any kind of um, allergic reaction to um, the organic materials, because uh, it's inorganic. But yeah, it's not, it's not, I can't imagine that paraffin wax is going to feel as nice as beeswax. I really, it's really worth finding beeswax. And you have a local apiary. You absolutely do. And they are just throwing away their beeswax, probably. Um, some places know how awesome their beeswax is and they sell it for what it's actually worth. But a lot of places, if they're selling local honey, just call them and ask them, what are you doing with your beeswax? I'd like to buy some off of you. Um, they'll probably give it to you uncleaned, which just means you have to melt it all and let all the non uh, beeswax stuff sink to the bottom of the liquid beeswax and then harden it. And then you just scrape off all of the, the dead bee parts and dirt and you have nice, clean, beautiful beeswax. That's how I, that's why I have these chunks. And then I bust it apart I freeze it in the freezer and I bust it apart with a hammer. It's very therapeutic. Okay, so um, we have about 20 minutes to the next class. Um, I will let GLaDOS stay in the room in case she just wants to kind of clean up uh, and she can turn off her video while she does that. Um, before she checks out though, I'll ask her just to check the chat box in case anyone else asks some questions. I'm going to take a respite break um, and I'll well, be back in about five minutes and the next class is on 14th century clothing clothing and sarai is i think in the room yes she is so um everything will be set up for on the hour for the next class to start thank you so much glados for showing us how to make um this recipe that is applicable to so many different time periods um all the way from the romans to um the victorians so no matter what you're reenacting this recipe is probably something that was used in your time period Thank you for coming. Uh, so, Franca, I'm sorry, I'm trying to keep track of. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. You were asking about storage vessel? Yeah, I mean, we're reenactors, so, uh, <laughs> you know, these goods may travel. How do you store? Okay, um, I'm going to actually turn my camera back on so I can show you some of my cool stuff. <laughs> Um, so this is my box for at home or if I'm going to like war and I want to have like home away from home. Um, and that's a smaller amount. That's actually, I, I, that's really my normal amount that I make, um, to have on hand. Uh, and it just keeps in here. I like this cause it's shaped like a Greek Pyxis, even though it's ceramic instead of, um, metal or glass, but it has the same shape. Um, so I like, this is like my vanity version. Um, you can put it in anything as long as it's going to stay at a stable temperature and not get um, melted. So you could put it in a Ziploc bag and then like cut the corner of the Ziploc bag and squirt it out like a tube. Squirt it out like a tube. 
Um, you want to make sure it's not porous um, because of por something porous will absorb the oil. Um, but almost anything will work. Is there a specific, like Romans had glass containers, they had ceramic containers, um, they had all kinds of really fancy containers. Well, in my period, there were lots of different um, vessels that were um, decorative and they were made specifically for certain objects and uh, or certain goods. Um, for example, a lady's fingernail file um, would have a certain kind of handle, but the the file portion would be made out of fish bone. Okay. And so, you know, and they were very specific about what the handle would look like, what would be on the handle, because, you know, they, they, if they thought that design um, affected um, the humors. And yes. so the designs were very specific. And I just wondered if you had ever thought about teaching a class on specifically storage vessels, because I think that we make some really great stuff and then we don't store it well or travel with it well. And, um, um, you know, I think that's some of the mistakes we make yeah. as reenactors. Well, this one is a pretty easy travel. Um, the main thing, oh, this is the thing, when you're camping, you cannot leave this in an unsealed box if there are bears, because there is enough honey in this, I kid you not, to attract bears. Um, it also will attract <laughs> ants. Good um, to know. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it also attracts ants. So um, I guess a, a, a tight, like a, a, a container that seals tight enough to keep ants out is probably an important part of it. Um, but yeah, that's a good point. Um, and there are other recipes that are a little bit more fussy when you want to travel with them. So I, I could definitely, I could definitely teach a class on storage vessels, um, especially the traveling with them part. Um, there's a Renaissance Rouge that was my first cosmetic I ever started making. It's Katarina Sforza recipe. It's alcohol based. And I've had that explode in my tent so many times um, from keeping it in a corked bottle. Um, it looks like a murder scene every time because I just come back to my tent and there's this big red puddle. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so that one, how you store it, is a little bit more, <laughs> more troublesome than this one. Well, there, you know, there's a letter that Isabella Deste writes, um, and she's asking for a box made of onyx because she would like to have civet oil. And she was a, she made perfumes and she liked to perfume her gloves, and so she was very specific about where she wanted the onyx quarried from, what the shape of the box should be. Um, and if they couldn't get that, well, then glass would be fine. But this is what she <laughs> wanted. Um, that might just, there, that sounds to a certain extent like um, the preference of the, you know, there are some really fastidious people who are very particular. Like she might have just been one of those very particular people, or she might have known her craft really well to the point where she knew that that specific um, sense would be changed by a different vessel. Um, and that's a different, like. Fastidious doesn't even cover it. <laughs> she was one of those people that would write two pages about um, leather for gloves that came from a certain city, from a certain maker, and it had to be this color, and it had to be um, treated this long, and you know, and if it didn't have, you know, and make sure you ask an expert because I don't trust you. <laughs> yeah, she sounds like a picky person and, I, you know, nothing wrong with that. I'm certainly picky when I know exactly what I want. Um, but that, that sounds like it might be a little bit uh, the user <laughs> as much as the art. Well, she speaks to my OCD, so. Ah, I, no, I totally understand. <laughs> I totally understand. Um, because there's not, there's not anything that specific called for in this particular recipe. That's, see, and that's really interesting. In, in a lot of the, um, in most medicinal recipes, they don't have anything that specific. 
but uh, they do when it's a kind of magical charm, if that makes sense. Like recipes for bewitchments, when you do run across them, are a lot more prone to be like that sort of level of specificity than recipes for something for gout, if that makes any sense. <laughs> I mean, it may not make sense, but if that, if you can understand what I mean. <laughs> yeah, I do. Yeah. Okay. The other this thing, this is yeah, Juliana. Ahead. Hi. Um, the other thing with, I don't know if you've ever, I'm assuming you've redacted recipes before, but um, a lot of times the information that are in a recipe is stuff that like you should just know that when we say a handful of this or a pinch of that is about this much because that was what was taught to you by your grandmother, your mother, that kind of thing. And that information was never really written down. So it's interesting when you have a period recipe and I've talked to several people who, who, who have done like scoppy and things of that nature, having to redact a recipe is always an interesting process because you have to kind of make it and figure it out mm -hmm. and, and do that kind of thing. So it's, it's understandable, you know, when you're making a recipe that you might have to play with it a little bit to figure out exactly how much of a certain ingredient you need to add to it. Yeah. Um, and always keep track of those things because I've actually found something that's really useful. Um, like whenever I make um, a pigmented ointment, essentially, um, like a foundation that's a white ointment, um, I use basically the same ratios of oil to pigment every time, um, like oil and wax and pigment. So if I get a new recipe, it tells me you put this pigment in this kind of oil with this kind of wax, I can look at the ratios from the last time I did a pigmented balm and or a pigmented ointment and just keep those same ratios um, and apply them to the new recipe, if that makes sense. Because they don't, um, they don't give a lot of exact measurements, but the key is not so much the measurement as the ratio in almost all of these ingredients. Um, and so the first thing to pay attention to is whether it's talking about volume or weight, and it'll say that usually because it'll list ounces if it's talking about weight and parts if it's talking about volume. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's crazy the amount of tidy details that are in the recipes when you redact them that you kind of have to pay attention to and uh, catch on and, and sort of know how to apply. Oh, there was one thing I was going to show. And Franca is still here that asked about storage vessels. Um, this is another way. It's a, technically a little bit after period technology, but um, well, it might, it's easily plausible. Um, it's a, I have these tiny butterbells and I put um, balms inside here and then just a little bit of water, rose water, orange blossom water, whatever down here. And that actually makes a watertight, an airtight seal around the balm to keep it from going rancid. Um, and in Florida, that's really handy because the weather here is really unkind to oils. So that's cool. Yeah, that's a fun, it's not, a, it's not anything I've seen referenced in period, but it is exactly the sort of smart thing they would figure out to do. So this is a little too thin to put in this, um, yeah. but with, kev with heavier things like the Roman cream that I make, this is a really good option. I'm gonna um, turn my camera off, but I will be here if anyone has questions thanks enjoyed it oh my pleasure i'm so glad same i enjoyed it as well thank you so much for coming it's been this is awesome